What's up guys, welcome back to the channel. My name is Jake and I give somewhat weekly product design tutorials. I know I've been slacking a bit of late, um, but I have been working very hard in this video. Today we're gonna to be talking about UI animation, motion design and interaction design and how you can leverage some of these techniques that I talk about to become a better designer. So for this presentation, I actually built the entire thing in Flinto. For those of you who don't know, Flinto is a really awesome interactive prototyping tool. It's one that I've been using for a long time. But the reason I'm using Flinto for this presentation and not like a PowerPoint or a Keynote is because I wanted to not only demo things live inside of Flinto, but I also wanted to share work from other designers and Flinto allows me to drag and drop GIFs and videos of other designers' work, who by the way, I'm gonna be crediting throughout this presentation as best as I can. I'm also gonna link their work below um, if I can find like the Dribble page or something similar. Also, like I mentioned in my last video, I am going to come out with a UI animation course this year. So if there are any topics you guys specifically want to learn in this area, I'm going to include a survey below that you guys can fill out. Also, whoever fills out the survey is most likely going to get a discount when this course actually drops, hopefully soon. So yeah, I'd really appreciate it if you guys fill that out. Um, again, I worked very hard in this video, so a thumbs up would be greatly appreciated if you guys take any value away from this. Oh, and last thing, um, this video is a bit longer than most of my videos, so I did include timestamps in both the description and the comment section if you guys want to use those to sort of jump around and navigate between topics. I think that might be helpful for you guys. But yeah, without further ado, let's get right into it. So really quickly, I just wanted to touch on some of the benefits of using motion and interactive prototyping. And there's four main benefits. The first being to better communicate your ideas to both developers and stakeholders. I found from personal experience, it's just a lot easier for me to design the entire experience with all the motion and interaction built in when I'm trying to explain something to a developer or stakeholder, rather than me just trying to walk them through a static visual comp and sort of walk them through the user journey. It's a lot easier for me to just hand off an interactive prototype that they can click through and really understand the experience. And doing it this way, there's less of a chance that a developer is going to poorly implement your design vision. You also just make sure that stakeholders really understand the vision. Motion and interactive prototyping can also help your work stand out, and this is true at both the personal and agency level. If a hiring manager is looking through your portfolio and sees some really nice motion and interaction work, it tells them that you're able to own more of the UI UX process, and this makes you a more valuable designer. Also at the agency level, oftentimes you're pitching a client to win work from them. So if you can sort of paint the entire design vision and provide an interactive prototype with a lot of really nice motion design and animations built in, there's more of a chance you can win that work because there's more of a chance you can wow them with really nice interactions and motion. And if you can give them an entire high fidelity prototype that closely mimics the end result, they can really picture themselves using that product or website, even if it's not fully developed yet. Also, another big part of motion interaction design is it helps you delight users. Think about your favorite digital products. There's probably a reason you keep coming back to them. I know me personally, my favorite products usually have a bunch of really nice interactions. It's usually just a bunch of little things that are done really well that lead to a great experience that keep me coming back. Lastly, in my opinion, this is the most important, that motion and interactive prototyping really helps push design forward. Nowadays, everything seems to be super templatized and everyone's coming out with UI kits, which generally have the same UI patterns, which is great that we're all sort of developing a global design language that is understood by everyone. And you know, we have quote unquote, best practices. But in my opinion, best practices are only best practices until we come up with better ways to solve the same issues. And in my opinion, the only way to push design forward is to explore new ways to interact with these digital products. The other thing to note is that devices are gonna be changing in the future, right? So right now we're used to flat displays. Everything's flat, 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 whether it's a computer monitor, laptop, you know, tablet, phone. The way we interact with these products isn't gonna change all that much, but as we move to VR and AR and these other mediums of communication, design is gonna change. So we're gonna to have to start thinking about new ways to interact with products for these different mediums. So when we talk about motion within the context of UI design, there's really three main types of motion. There's functional motion, there's structural motion, and emotional motion. And functional motion really helps improve the usability and user experience. Think like drag and drop interactions or anything that really helps you accomplish a goal quicker or more easily. Um, also animated hover and click states could be examples of functional motion. Here's an example that I really like, and I actually made this animated component right here inside of Flinto. Um, I can hover over this button. We get some indication that, you know, once we press this button, something's gonna happen. So once we press it, we get this little loading indication, and then we get some confirmation that our message was sent. So this could definitely be leveraged in some sort of messaging app or some email app. And when you think about it, we're really combining three different components into one. And one thing I really like about this is all I'm doing is clicking the send button and my eye doesn't have to move away from this. 
I hit send, I get some loading indication that something's being sent, and then I get confirmation that it's sent, all just by clicking this one CTA. So I think this is a really good example of functional motion at the component level. Then we get into structural motion, and this was really made popular by Google's material design. Um, they use animation really effectively to help illustrate an app or digital product's structure. So I'll show you some examples, but basically elements moving on and off the screen, items growing into detail views, modals, dropdowns, tooltips. And then you get into emotional motion, and there's sort of two schools of thought when it comes to emotional motion, which is more or less just designing to delight users. And one school of thought is actually shared by myself and other designers mostly who are always putting experience first, right? We're always thinking user experience first. How can we make this experience that our user is going through the most memorable experience possible? And then there's the other school of thought, which is usually held by developers and even the business, right? Where it's a little harder for them to see the value in terms of dollars of adding this extra layer of emotional motion on top of, you know, the more functional UX work. And it's really about finding the balance. Obviously, you don't want to overdo it with these moments of delight. You don't want every single interaction in your product to be like an animated experience that like is really trying to wow the user, right? Sometimes you have to think performance first. You have to take into account time and budget constraints. Generally, it's about finding the balance, right, between these three elements here. And in my opinion, good motion can combine elements, right? We can combine emotional and functional motion. Here's an example. Here's like a day to night toggle, right? A lot of apps these days have dark or light mode. And sometimes there's just a simple toggle switch, right? But in this case, there's actually a little illustration here. So when I toggle between day and night, you know, it's a little more memorable, right? Whereas if it was just a regular toggle, you know, that doesn't really leave the user with a lasting impression. But doing something like this just ensures that we can impact our users on more of an emotional level. And you know, it's fun. Like this is actually enjoyable to do. So here are some examples of functional motion. To the left, we have a drag to reorder interaction. And I actually made a tutorial on how to do this inside of principle. If you guys wanted to go check that out, I'll link that on the screen. Here we have a drag and drop add to playlist interaction, which I think is pretty cool. But notice like, yes, these are delightful, but they're at the same time, they're helping the user accomplish a goal. So they're really functional at their core. Here we have a dashboard design, looks like an activity feed of some sort, and the user is dragging to rearrange their activities and changing their status from in progress to done, which I think is a really cool use of functional motion here. So here we have some structural motion examples. And notice these guys here on the left, even at this very low fidelity stage, we already understand how this app is sort of structured. Like this guy here on the right, we have some sort of tab style navigation where we can either tab between these two sections or we can swipe between these two sections. So it's already giving a sense of how this app is structured, where here we have some list items that are expanding, right? We have some expanded states. So we're already getting a sense of the structure as well as the key interactions that will occur on these screens. So I would encourage you guys to actually try starting here, right? Like start with motion and interaction first before you even dive into the visual design of your products and just see how it impacts your final design output. I've noticed for myself, it's made a huge difference and I'm starting to create a lot better products when I'm thinking motion and interaction first. Here's an example from Google's material design where we have a list view expanding into a detailed view and it's it's all happening very seamlessly, right? Like, like we don't even notice really that there's a change in elevation here. There's a, a slight change in the structure of these layers. Um, and I think good structural design should be very seamless. It shouldn't be very jarring. It should feel natural and I think this is a really good example. And here's a higher fidelity example, right? We have a user drilling down into these detailed views of these cards and everything's happening very seamlessly. Um, you would almost expect this to be the case, right? When you click on this card, you would expect it to sort of fill the viewport, um, but it's all happening very seamlessly. So I think this is a good example. Here we have some examples of emotional motion. And here on the left, we have a very human onboarding experience, right? We've all had some sort of onboarding experience when we're signing up for a product or service and we're being asked to input some information about ourselves. Well, this experience is particularly enjoyable because it's not just like form fields asking us to input text, right? Using our thumbs. There's some really cool interactions here as well as some, some really nice illustrations that just make this feel a little more relatable, a little more human um, and just memorable altogether. This is a simple way to, you know, add some flavor to an otherwise cookie cutter onboarding experience. Then here on the right, um, we have a uh, character illustration from Google's material design, where they're really just making the most of an error state here. And it's just these little things that tend to add up to create a really enjoyable experience. 
Now let's talk a bit about the anatomy of an interaction. So all interactions will have four main parts. They'll have a trigger, a response, they'll have timing, and they'll have easing applied to them. The trigger is what actually causes the animation, whether that's a mouse over, a tap, a swipe, a scroll, even page load can be an interaction trigger. Then we have the response, which is what actually happens to the element or elements once they're triggered. So do they move, do they flip, do they decrease in opacity, change color, grow or shrink, to name a few. Then we have the timing, which is comprised of two parts. We have the duration and the delay. The duration is how long the animation takes. And then we have the delay, which is how long after the trigger the animation will begin. Then we get into easing, which is pretty much the physics of the animation. I'm gonna show you some examples of easing, but this is more or less the smoothness of the animation. And we use easing generally to help our digital products replicate the real world as much as we can. So a quick note on timing, and these are not hard and fast rules by any means. These are more like guiding principles. So like when in doubt, right? If you have something like a micro interaction, like a hover or a click state of a button or like a radio button selection, you don't wanna use very long durations for these, right? Or else your product is gonna start feeling very slow and laggy. You want these things to be very quick. And I recommend 300 milliseconds max um, for these types of interaction or else your perceived performance might suffer. Notice how I said perceived performance because you can sort of use timing to hack your product into feeling faster or more performant. And I'll show you an example of how to do this. But on the flip side, you wanna use longer durations for things that are a little more dramatic in nature like screen to screen transitions or elements that traverse larger parts of the screen. These would be good things to use longer durations on. So here we have some examples that really illustrate how timing can influence the way your brand is perceived. Here we have sort of an elegant and dramatic theme. Notice this designer chose to use a bit slower timings, like even on these hover states here, right? Like typically hover states shouldn't take this long, but he's almost using these hover states stylistically to create drama in this design. Even that like screen wipe there, it wasn't very snappy, but it was very dramatic and elegant, which sort of speaks to this Patagonia brand. They're all about exploring and getting outside and living your life to the max. Like it's very dramatic. Well, here on the right, we have something that feels very snappy and performant, all because the timing is a lot quicker and a lot snappier. Here we have some examples of staggered timing, which is essentially adding slight time delays to elements to create this more organic and flowing feel. So we have staggered timing applied here and this wipe and reveal effect, which I think is done really well. And here we have some list items loading in a staggered fashion. So they're not all entering and exiting at the same time, which creates a more realistic feel. So let's talk a bit about easing. And remember from before, easing is sort of the physics of our interaction. And it can really help influence an interaction's smoothness. And there's five main easing curves that you guys will come across regardless of the UI animation software you guys are using. There's linear easing. There's ease in, which is also known as accelerate. There's ease both which might also be referred to as ease in, ease out. There's ease out, which is also known as decelerate. And then there's elastic easing, which might also be referred to as spring easing. Now easing is super important in digital product design and web design because applying easing to our interactions can really help our digital products emulate the physical world, which is one of the markers of good product design in my opinion, right? We want everything we're doing on the web or on our phones to feel very natural and very familiar. And a proper understanding of easing and a proper application of easing to our interactions can really help accomplish this. Each of these easing graphs helps show the relationship between an object's position over time. So if you would imagine the y-axis is an object's position and the x-axis is the time of that interaction, we can adjust the easing curve to help influence how an object moves over time. Now here's an example that'll help you understand the relationship between an object's total duration and the easing curve that is applied to that object. So here we have five different squares and the total duration it takes all of these squares to move from one end of the screen to the other end of the screen is two seconds as indicated up here. But the only difference between these squares is the easing that is applied to them. So in this first row, this first square is moving at a linear constant rate. It's not speeding up or slowing down at any point over the course of its duration. It's moving at a constant rate. Now in the real world, objects don't really move in a linear fashion almost ever because we have physics, right? We have things like gravity and friction that either speed up or slow down our elements. Now, if you look below, we have an example of ease in or acceleration where 
the object reaches its fastest point as it gets closer and closer to the edge of the screen. So it starts slow and ends fast. It's accelerating over time. Now below that, we have an example of ease out, which is just the opposite. It's actually slowing down or decelerating over time. So its fastest point is initially, and then it ultimately slows down to a dead stop. Now the one below that, it actually reaches its fastest point in the very middle because it's easing in, then easing out. So it's accelerating, then decelerating. Now this bottom square is an example of spring or elastic easing. And one thing to note about elastic easing is that the total duration is a byproduct of both the tension and the friction that you set on the spring easing curve. This is if it's a true spring. Now it's really fun to make these really springy, bouncy animations, but you gotta be careful not to overdo it because they tend to go on a bit longer than it actually seems, right? Like it seems like the square reaches the end way before everything else, but it's actually slightly moving back and forth, um, taking a bit more time. So be careful not to overuse spring animation in your product design. And I'm gonna show you some practical examples of when it would be a good idea to use spring versus some of these other ones. So here's an example of linear easing. And like I said before, you rarely use linear easing in product design, but here's an example where it actually would make sense to use linear because we have a song playing and songs play one second at a time at a constant rate. So this filling animation of this music player here is actually moving at a constant rate. And I made a separate tutorial on how I animated this music app inside of Envision Studio. If you guys are interested, I will leave that on the screen somewhere. Now I'm gonna use an example to help illustrate the difference between ease out ease in and ease both. So in the context of product design, generally objects that enter a viewport or enter the screen will decelerate. We wanna slow them down as they arrive. So in this case, we have an avocado that is moving from outside the screen to on the screen. We don't really care about what's happening while it's off the screen because we can't see it. We only want it to arrive smoothly once it enters the viewport. So we apply a deceleration, which looks something like this, it's slowing down over time. Now. The opposite is true for when an object exits the screen. We want to accelerate off the screen. So just remember, accelerate, exit. They sound very similar. So that's a good way to remember this if you're ever stuck. So enter, decelerate, exit, accelerate. Now ease both is probably your safest bet for applying easing to objects that always remain on the screen. So they're always within the user's view. It's just a more natural way of moving elements. So I know that avocado example is kind of stupid and it might be hard to actually apply this to your actual product design. So here's maybe a more practical example. What you're looking at here is like your standard top bar for some sort of e-commerce company. Just pretend this is like Amazon or Walmart, very standard e-com top navigation with a hamburger menu. So when we open the menu, we have this fly in. So something's entering the screen. So we actually want to decelerate it. So we apply an ease out easing to decelerate. Now you can probably guess what happens when we close the menu. We want to accelerate it off the screen. So this is sort of how we apply easing in the context of real world product design. So in this next example, I'm going to demo spring or elastic easing. So we have some sort of social media feed. In this case, it looks very similar to Twitter. And we have a floating action button here. And when the user taps on this floating action button, some sub actions are revealed. So we can either write a post, we can share, or we can add a photo. But notice the very subtle bounce that was applied to each of these sub, sub actions here. And there's also a slight time delay. So the share icon is delayed slightly after this post icon and this photo icon is delayed slightly after the share icon. So there is a slight stagger. And together with that subtle bounce, we're just giving this interaction a bit more personality, a bit more character, and it's subtle enough where performance isn't taking a hit, right? Like we still want to be able to accomplish our goals as quickly as possible. Whereas if I applied a lot of bounce to this, I might not be able to write a post as quickly, which would actually detract from the user experience. So it's all about finding that balance between performance, usability, and personality. Here's an example of good versus bad easing. And I pulled this directly from Google's material design guidelines. But this one on the left here, notice that Elements are speeding up and slowing down together. Everything's synchronized and feels very cohesive. It's very smooth. There's no jarring animation here. Whereas here on the left, it's the exact opposite, right? We have elements easing out that should be easing in. The timing is all off, like on these icons, they're kind of fading out at different rates. It just doesn't feel smooth, doesn't feel natural. It's very jarring. So here's a good side-by-side -side of good versus bad easing. Now I'm gonna talk about creating depth using motion, which is one of my favorite parts of UI design. 
So the first way to create depth in these digital product environments is to play with the relative scale. So when I say relative scale, we mean the scale of one object relative to another object. This designer has used scale very effectively. Basically, as a card increases in scale relative to the other cards, that card appears closest to the user and vice versa. As they scale down, they appear further away. It's a really simple way to create depth just by increasing relative scale. Now here's another example where we're swiping from one photo to another within a gallery. This was an interaction I actually pulled directly from the Uber Eats app and I made a tutorial on it. I'll link on the screen somewhere. But basically as one photo enters the screen, the one leaving the screen is scaling down and fading out. And the one entering the screen looks like it's moving over top of it. And notice there's no drop shadows here or anything. All we're doing is messing with the relative scale to create that depth. Another way we can create depth within our digital products is using parallax motion. And you've probably seen parallax motion all over sites like Dribbble, but essentially parallax motion is defined as a depth cue that causes objects that are closer to you to appear to move faster than objects that are further away. And the further away something is, the slower it appears to move. Parallax motion influences how we judge relative distance. So before we talked about relative scale, parallax motion has more to do with relative distance. So to illustrate the parallax effect in the more traditional animation sense, I'm gonna use this awesome illustration by Pablo Stanley. I actually pulled this directly from a tutorial he made on the matter on his channel. So I'm gonna link you guys out to that if you're interested. But essentially we have some foreground elements, some midground elements and some background elements. So we have elements that sort of sit in different ranges of our field of view. And as these elements animate, we get the sense that the elements closest to us are moving the fastest relative to the elements that are set further back in the field of view. So in this case, these clouds are like the furthest back. And then we have this mountain layer that's moving really quickly. It's almost whipping by us. It's almost like you were looking out the window of a car, right? Say you're on the highway and you have some trees right off to your right. Those are gonna appear to almost whip by you relative to say the clouds and the sun and the moon that's set further back from those trees. So I'm sure you guys have experienced that while riding in a car, very similar. We just tried to recreate it with vector shapes here. But this isn't as applicable to your everyday product design. Something you guys might see more often in your everyday web browsing experiences is something called parallax scrolling, where as we scroll down the page, different elements on the screen appear to move at different rates. And I've made videos on how to accomplish this effect um, in a few different design tools. So maybe I'll link that on the screen somewhere. But this is a bit more of a practical example of how to use the parallax effect in web design and product design. I've also been seeing the parallax effect used a bit more stylistically of late. In these examples, layer masks are used to create these sort of depth containers. So basically we have a foreground element, which is the front of the card, and then the background element, which in this case is the photo within these cards. And basically as the user swipes, the photo within the card is moving at a slightly different rate than the rate at which you are swiping which is creating a subtle parallax effect. And in this case, it's the same idea. The only difference is the image within the card is actually fixed, it's not moving, but the card and the image is still moving at a slightly different rate, creating this parallax effect. I think this one's really cool in particular. It's a really cool play on card swiping. Usually everything kind of moves together, but in this case, this designer has chosen to fix the element within the depth container. So really cool stylistic application of parallax. One thing I really love using these interactive prototyping tools for is leveling up my design systems and testing out all the different states of all the components within the design system. And as you see here, we have some, we have like a sample component library, which includes buttons, form elements, and little card component, but they all have all of the states of these components built in. They're all designed right inside this tool. So we can really test them in high fidelity. And say, for example, right now I'm using Flinto, but what I could do is I could build a really simple card layout, right? And I could test this card component in context. So we can get a sense of how these interactions actually look and feel in the context of an actual layout rather than just at the component level. And we can get a feel for this digital product this way. Like, you know, maybe there's, you know, maybe this hover effect is a little too much and that's what I'm realizing right now. So in context, it's a lot easier to tell, you know, if these states should be adjusted or not. Maybe we want to, maybe let's get rid of these guys and we could build like a sample, a sample login screen, right? So just pretend this says username, maybe this one says password. 
and maybe this switch here is like the, you know, remember me or something. And you get a feel for your form layouts this way. So a really cool way to quickly test components before you go into build. And just overall, you know, you can port your entire design system over to a tool like Flinto or Principle, which has all the states of, of your entire design system built in. So if you want to test with users, you can test in high fidelity and you can test things in context really easily. Now, here are some common motion design tools that you guys can use. Um, you guys might be wondering, where's After Effects on this list? I actually didn't include After Effects because you cannot create anything interactive with After Effects. Yes, you can create videos and really awesome motion work inside of After Effects and do some really cool 3D stuff. It's, it's a professional motion design tool, essentially. But the drawback is you can't actually create something interactive that you can test on your device or put in the hands of users or test with the actual intended gestures in, in your application, whether that's a swipe gesture or, or a scroll gesture. You can't do that with a video, but you can do that in some of these interactive prototyping tools like Envision Studio, Flinto, Principle, and I also use Webflow a lot, but um, I only actually detailed out these three. I'm not gonna read all these. You guys can kind of do your own research. I've made plenty of videos outlining sort of the pros and cons of all these videos, and I'm actually gonna make a separate video probably on my favorite design tools, so look out for that. Um, you guys can kind of read through this if you want, but these are some popular interactive prototyping tools on the market. I know Protopie is another popular one. I don't have much experience with it, so I'm not gonna speak to it. Um, one thing I will say, anything drag-based or scroll-based that I wanna prototype and validate really quickly, I'll usually use Principle. I just think it's the best suited tool for anything drag or scroll-based. It's really easy with the driver window. FramerX is another popular one that allows you to work with React components. But again, the tool you choose is gonna depend on your specific needs and the specific needs of your design team. Me personally, like I rarely have to do anything React-based. I pretty much choose the tools that make it as simple as possible for me to validate ideas quickly, and then I can show my ideas to a developer who will actually code the thing. I don't wanna worry about code at all as a designer. One exception is when I'm doing responsive web design Maybe I'm designing some sort of like marketing website that doesn't really have an intricate back end at all. I can pretty much design and code the whole thing in Webflow and my output will be completely responsive, which is really nice. I'm not gonna get into all the details of Webflow. You guys should do your own research. These are just some tools that I find myself using in my everyday workflow that have worked pretty well for me. Here's an example of some things you can make inside of Principle. This one on the left here, I actually made a tutorial on how to do this, this drag and drop add to gallery interaction. I'll look that on the screen somewhere if you guys are interested. But like I said, I tend to use principle for these drag and drop or scroll based interactions. It just seems to be the tool best suited for these types of things. This one in the middle, there's a really awesome Tinder style card swiping interaction. So pretty detailed interaction that you can do natively inside of principle. Same with this guy. The fact that this designer was able to do this all inside of principle is pretty mind blowing. These are really intricate interactions. And the benefit of this is it's not just a video. Like I can actually put this in the hands of users or I can test the look and feel of my product on a device before it goes into development. I can share this with a developer just to make sure they get the look and feel completely right. They can test it themselves on their device. So pretty powerful stuff that you can do inside of principle. Here's some stuff that you can make inside of studio. This one on the left, I actually made a two part video series on how to make this player stats dashboard. If you guys wanna go check that out. Some pretty intricate animations here. One thing I really enjoy about Studio is that their default easing values seem to be the smoothest for whatever reason. I've just experienced that personally, which means less time I have to spend adjusting the easing of each individual layer. I could be completely wrong about that. I just have noticed that the feel of the easing seems to be better out of the box. Um, not a huge deal, not a deal breaker, but something I noticed. One other great thing about Studio is as a standalone design tool, it's pretty damn good. It is still missing some things like Sketch and Figma have, like background blurs, and I know they're all working on this stuff, but it's a pretty complete design tool as well. Um, I probably wouldn't use it to build out like a design system or anything. I'd still use Sketch or Figma to do something like that, but it's pretty complete in terms of being able to design from low to very high fidelity all in the same tool. Here on the right, we have a really awesome photography portfolio, it looks like with some really intricate animations, really smooth animations by this designer. So just gives you an idea of some of the stuff you guys can do inside of Studio. And I have a whole Studio playlist if you guys really wanna learn Studio. So I wanted to just wrap up this video with a bunch of really good motion studies that I found. 
Um, I kind of organized them by navigation and data visualization. So you'll see how I sort of organize these. But I found some really great use of motion to create some new navigation constructs that maybe we otherwise wouldn't have thought of. You know, as design gets like super templatized these days, um, there's a lot of like cookie cutter templates out there that designers are leveraging and UI kits. Um, but it's really the motion design that really helps you create new and interesting navigation patterns and UI patterns. So I just thought some of these were really awesome. Um, here we have like this interactive tab bar. I've actually made a tutorial on how to make this inside of Studio. Um, you see like a lot of this navigation is swipe based and scroll based, which is not something you can really get from just a static design template. See, like this is not a navigation pattern that we're gonna just find in a random UI kit, right? Like this is something you really have to think about from a motion and interactive perspective to be able to prototype. And some of these tools allow you to do this really easily. So just thought these were some cool navigation explorations. You can also use motion to really up your data visualization. I really like this example. Again, it's a very low fidelity motion study here, but like you already get the point of how you're using motion to bring your data to life. This one here on the left is probably not something you can do in an interactive prototyping tool. You'll definitely need like After Effects or some 3D animation software to do that 3D transition, but you can kind of stitch together stuff from After Effects and a tool like Principal and Flinto to create these really awesome data visualizations. Here's another one that I thought was super interesting. Some really cool data visualization studies that really leverage good motion design. I'm also a really big fan of using motion to make our digital products really feel like physical products in a way. And I thought these are really good motion studies. Like this one on the left is a very lifelike ticket buying experience where this designer literally like takes you inside of a movie theater to pick your seating and buy a ticket for a movie. Here's a really cool navigation experience that's very immersive, feels like real life. Here's a really awesome uh, flight purchasing experience. It makes you actually feel like you're on a plane flying, which is pretty cool. And here are just some really cool micro interactions that I saw on Dribble. Um, I really like the swipe to delete by Kuberto Design. I've actually seen a tutorial on how they do this in After Effects. They've actually been able to implement this in code. So, you know, I am a big proponent of just always trying to design the best, most interactive experience and let the developers figure it out. Because <laughs> when there's a will, there's a way. We shouldn't have to box ourselves in and you know, put limits on ourselves. This is how we push design forward. We gotta start thinking out of the box and you know, good motion design really helps us do this. Here's another really cool interaction. <laughs> I don't know how practical this one is or how possible this one is to implement, but yeah, pretty cool how this, uh, how these cards sort of shrink down to the top navigation here. Just thought that was a really interesting micro interaction that I hadn't really seen before. So I'm gonna stop the video here. Hopefully you guys learned a lot of valuable techniques and tips and tricks that you guys can leverage throughout your product design journey. If you have any questions or feedback around this video, I'd really love to hear what you have to say in the comments section. I'll make sure I read and answer every one of you guys. So definitely drop any questions or feedback below. Thanks so much for watching and I will talk to you guys in the next one.